Thanks, Will, and welcome, everyone. So I, I'd like to pick up where I left off at last year's graduation <laughs> uh, and continue with the theme. And in all seriousness, I've given a lot of thought to something I said at last year's graduation, and I've refined it a bit. Now, of course, this isn't going to help the class of 2013 at all. They're not here, but there are a few of them here that I've seen, and I'll make sure they deliver the message. Last commencement, I played around with this kind of funny term, scrappy. And I used scrappy to describe a kind of unifying theme that ran through all of our students and ran through the college itself, much like what Will just described. But because the word can have negative connotations, you know, you picture like an unkempt dog of some sort, um, I was very careful to divine it of having the qualities of being expert at getting things done, of breaking through bureaucratic barriers, and of not being held back by the fear of failure. I still believe this word is spot on for the college and our students, and I'm, I'm reminded of it every time I walk by Jody Baker's office. Jody Baker is a faculty member here, and on her door she has a poster that's entitled The Cult of Dunn Manifesto. And on it is my favorite line that says, people without dirty hands are wrong. And um, <laughs> I loved it. And, um, but I was walking by Jody's office one day, and it hit me that the term scrappy uh, unduly emphasizes action over thought, and that gave me a little bit of pause. I emphasize action over thought. That's kind of how my brain tends to be wired, uh, and I've seen both the good and the, the bad of that, and I always have to work at patience. My wife says uh, our black lab, Lucy, has a longer attention span than I do, and she's probably right, but I've thought about this dichotomy between thought and action, between theory and praxis, and it came to me that it's a little bit of a existential crisis for our age. On the one hand, the modern world worships the 140 character Twitter feed, we're constantly being asked to develop rapid prototypes, sorry Jay Friedlander, we force complex ideas into simple elevator speeches, sometimes dumbed down elevator speeches. Moore's law is king and fast is king. But then there's an emerging movement, thankfully, that appreciates the slow and the thoughtful. The slow food movement emphasizes, you know, contemplatively grown, prepared, and consumed food. The slow money trend is about reconnecting finance back to doing good for people and for place. Long reads are an increasingly popular genre on the internet, and they're a good uh, counterbalance to Twitter feed. There's there's a rebirth in natural history with its emphasis on patient observation. And there's even slow TV. In Norway, there was a slow TV program that one in five of all Norwegians watched. Um, it features burning firewood in a hearth for 12 hours. And the black lab in me said, hey, that's taking contemplative a little bit too far. There's got to be a happy balance. Um, but if I could get a do-over for last year's graduation, I'd refine my message and say that the theme that's running through all of the students here and through the college of the whole isn't just that we're scrappy, but it's that we get the balance right between thought and action. And hitting this balance, I'm calling contemplative scrappiness. <laughs> and learning contemplative scrappiness is like learning to drive a stick shift. And here I've got to give credit to my assistant and advisor, Kate Mako. Where is Kate? There's Kate. Kate said to me one day, you know, she said, yeah, it's kind of like the feel between clutch and gas shifting into a, re a, a first gear on a really steep side street in San Francisco. Um, and knowing this group, as I do, I am 100% confident that they've got this feel. Um, their training began by being thrown into and then managing a self-designed curriculum. That's no easy feat, and requiring them to build their own curriculum invokes contemplative scrappiness. Ben, ben mastered it by first reimagining Shakespeare's Othello and then producing, directing, and performing in it. Yuka patiently considered the structures 
of a diabetic struggling kidney and then went to the Jackson Lab and helped build a new kidney. Gabby sought an understanding of modern femininity and then created works of art to help explain that to the world. And Chloe studied the impact of mammals on vegetation on offshore islands and then actually measured and tested it. Um, at CUA, we emphasize what I like to call expeditionary learning, right? That is taking and extracting the mind and body out of the classroom. But clearly, the most meaningful expeditions are both mental and physical. And again, what we get right is this balance of approaches, from contemplative natural history and thoughtful observation to the proactive and experimental quest for new knowledge, from understanding law and policy to the use of activism to promote change, from the analysis of economic drivers and economic hurdles to the creation of new and better business, from the theory of color to the utility of color and so on. We're not heavy on requirements here, but we do require that these students swim in both the pool of action and the pool of theory. Now, what makes us especially good at promoting contemplative scrappiness is our dedication to mentorship. At CUA, the great mentor, I think you'll all agree, is not the one who transfers information from their brain to yours. The great mentor is he or she who helps work, work through failure with you, who pushes on those uncomfortable points of your character or brain, who helps cultivate passions, and most importantly, who suggests when it's time to just pull back a little bit and when it's time to hit the gas and run and get things done. It's that sometimes annoying parent or friend in the passenger seat saying, gas, give the dang thing more gas, or clutch, Darren, engage the clutch, please. Our mentors, our faculty, staff, students, partners here on the MDI community, these mentors and our commitment to the process of mentorship, that is what we do better than anyone else out there. That is the value proposition of COA that I want you all to scream from the rooftops. That is the piece of our pedagogy which can't be replicate, replicated in a massive open online course or in a lecture hall filled with thousands. To slow down and balance this presidential optimism, I looked toward less biased sources than my mind, and I looked at the New York Times and the Gallup poll. Now, a few weeks ago on, on May 7th, Times columnist Charles Blow wrote a piece called In College, Nurturing Matters. Blow wrote that nurturing, or what we're calling today mentoring, is the key indicator of both success in finding engaged work and in finding a sense of well-being after graduation. Blow based his theory on a Gallup poll of six questions, which together characterize this concept of nurturing, and he concluded more than a college's selectivity or ranking in the U.S. News and World Report, the size of its library, the size of its endowment, the number and novelty of labs, its strong mentors, consistent interaction within a community, and long-term team-based projects that have the most profound effect on your coming career. So I then flexed my own contemplative scrappy muscles and conducted an experiment on these people sitting right here. Unaware of my intentions of using these data in today's ceremony, they filled out a similar questionnaire, and sure enough, COA more than doubled the national average of that Gallup poll, a strong indicator that our approach really works. So after this slowing down, I'm now doubly confident. A self-designed curriculum, a focus on learning in a community like we do, expeditionary teaching and our dedication to sex successful mentoring, that's given these 74 individuals the firmest footing possible for taking on the challenges of a really tumultuous world. It's given them a great starting point for life to improving the condition of humanity, nature, and themselves. COA is a citizenry based on contemplative scrappiness. And this group of graduates, probably now really tired by my long-windedness, is ready to take the world by storm, like Will said. And we're ready to let you go and celebrate and move mountains. Today is our 41st commencement ceremony, and today we will graduate the 2,000th alum.
2000. Sorry, I'm sweating here. 2000, somewhere about two-thirds of the way down the, uh, the alphabet. Uh, and this all began with our first graduate, Kathy Johnson, from the class of 1974. Do you know she was three-quarters of the way through her Yale degree? Three-quarters of the way when she picked up and transferred and came to COA, then a startup school of 36 students, half a dozen faculty, a handful of staff. Bill tells us more dogs than people on campus. Um, and we were unaccredited and unsure of what was going to happen in 1975. Her parents were skeptical, let's say. <laughs> um, but she, like all of you, was contemplatively scrappy. Now Kathy's a senior staff attorney for the Natural Resources Council of Maine and a leader in the struggle to protect the ecological integrity of Maine's northern forests. And joining Kathy and all the others, now I'll ask these graduates to find time in your busy and adventurous lives to be that mentor in the passenger seat, to advise on action and thought, on doing and thinking, and on slow and fast and to help all future cohorts of COA students realize their own dreams. Thank you all, and graduates, welcome to the family. Yeah. I now, I want to introduce Jeeva and Sobrina Wheeler to deliver the welcome on behalf of the class of 2014. Woo! 